Good afternoon and welcome to the you know, one of the two final talks of the conference. I have the honor of concluding the conference just as I had the honor of opening it in the other room. And whereas um, in the first talk I was talking about the various cool optimizations that we now do in GCC 8 mostly when we do not use LTO and I encourage you to have a look into the proceedings if you didn't have the opportunity to see it. Now I'll be talking about what we can do when we do enable LTO. Um, I should, before I start, I should definitely say that most of the material, the paper, and most of the slides have actually been prepared by Martin Liška and Jan Hubička, who are unfortunately not here. Uh, they know a little bit more definitely than me about these things, uh, but I hope that I will be able to convey all the necessary information and answer any questions, hopefully, that may arrive. So first and foremost, let me quickly ex explain what the difference in between the classical compilation scheme that was developed long, long time ago and the LTO one is. In the classical compilation scheme, what happens is that you invoke the compiler on several C files, if you, for example, compile C language, and uh, that take that file and all the included uh, files and, compi and compiles into the object file, <coughs> which can take some time. The compiler is very often supposed to be an optimizing one, so you know it should not take ages. The, you know, the algorithms use have to be quick. Nevertheless, um, the idea is that you know we, we sh now we should be able to compile many compilation units at, uh, at, at the same moment. And mainly, that if you only change one file, we compile that file, and then we have a super quick linker that uh, puts all these things together, combines them, and produces the executable. In LTO. Uh, we try to solve the problem that the compiler only sees one, you know, the files that are part of a single compilation unit. So it's the C file plus all the includes, but it does not see all the functions outside. So what happens is that, you know, uh, you have definitely seen various small functions that should be inlined that are part of header functions instead of being where they, you know, logically should be in the in a C or a C++ file. And that is how programmers overcome this limitation when it comes to inlining, and it shouldn't be necessary. And uh, often the mm, compiler should be able to make uh, more clever decisions than uh, the programmer. And therefore what we do is that in the LTO scheme, when you actually invoke the compiler, GCC, G++, G4Tran, uh, Ada, and so forth, uh, the compiler parses the C file, parses all the includes and all the sources that are part of that compilation unit, um, and it produces an O file uh, on but object file, but that object file does not actually um, contain the you know almost ISA or basically ISA object code, but it contains sections with intermediate language that are specific not only to the compiler but also to the uh, compiler version. And when you then invoke linker on them, uh, the linker finds out, okay, this is you know, not, not, fine, not really compiled stuff. And through a plugin uh, that, it, that it has for the, uh, the compilers that it knows, it, invoke, it invokes the compiler again. And now the compiler has access to all stuff that you're linking together. So it can be either the whole program in, on many occasions or the whole um, shared object, you know, dynamically loaded library, and can make cross-module decisions. It can uh, propagate various information, uh, such as constants, value ranges, uh, information about which bits might be set in different, different arguments. It, uh, uh, it uh, uh, basically has access to all of uh, the program and can make use of information from all of it. What actually happens, in, because you know, what we want to do is we try to keep as much of the compilation process parallelizable. So what really happens is that the LTO plugin invokes a whole program analysis uh, part of the compiler. Let me let me call it that way. Uh, that uh, whole program analysis will look at uh, what is stored in the in, in the intermediate language and will make all sorts of decisions. What should be inlined where? What should be propagated where? Then it partitions the program into a number of partitions. 
uh, streams those out um, and, and invokes um, sort of the rest of the compilation compiler on them. And that step can again be done in parallel. And uh, when these all finish their, com their compilations, they invoke assembler. And uh, after the final uh, assembly is produced, L you know, the control is returned to back to the linker so that it combines the result of uh, now real object files, new object files, and actually produces um, a.out. This has, as I have already said a little bit, various benefits. Um, yeah, I've already talked about the second one, cross-module inlining, but what really happens is that the visibility, the scope of various uh, functions and symbols in general uh, can be more limited. Very often, a compiler can do much more with a function if that function is static, uh, sorry, static, if it uh, is not exported to the, you know, to outside of the compilation unit and in, in a standard method of compilation. And um, if its address is not taken, it, it knows that if that function, for example, has only one or two calls and, you know, we definitely want to inline the first one, we then probably also want to inline the second one because we really know there are only two calls and we have complete control over that function. We can change the prototype of that function. We can uh, split various arguments, remove arguments that are not used, and so on and so forth. Um, so that is really, really useful. Often people just forget to write static uh, in, front of their in front of their function or uh, you know, the use is really trivial, but just somewhere else because lo it logically belongs to a different compilation unit and then, you, know, you, you should not be structuring your sources according how the compiler wants to compile it. You should be structuring them uh, according to what makes logical sense for the sources that you write. Um, another thing that is, you know, and th that is connected with it, uh, and that's aggressive unreachable code removal. We, very often, a lot of functions that are in an application in a DSO are actually unreachable. Uh, you know, they are called only on an architecture that you're not interested in. Uh, they are called only, big, you know, if some if def is that's not actually satisfied. And uh, a lot of code can often really be uh, removed. And uh, code size improvements, as I will show you in a moment, are actually one of the biggest benefits of LTO. We can do um, more useful pro profile propagation, sort of see uh, how likely it is that portions of codes are executed frequently and therefore how uh, important it is to optimize different portions of an application. We can uh, look at exception handling uh, things in, in, in the compiled binary and uh, propagate, for example, a no throw in C++ so, and, and so that we know that we don't have to care about catching exceptions because there won't be any. We do have a pass that looks at functions that are exactly the same on a semi-binary level and uh, squash them into one. Um, this is very useful in various C++ templates that work with pointers to different objects, but ultimately they are only pointers, so eventually it's going to be the same thing. And uh, it can, you know, all of them can actually be represented by one function, and we can optimize code layout, and there's lots and lots of more stuff that we can do. It does have some drawbacks, however, uh, one thing is that, uh, yeah, to support LTO, it's a lot of work, um, and uh, we've been working on it for a long time. I will uh, talk a little bit, a little bit about that as well. Um, the compile edit cycle can be much slower if you are really working when you're, you know, when when you are adding new code or, or changing functionality of just one single compilation unit, just one single .c file. In the traditional scheme of things, what you do is that you make your change, then you um, invoke make. Make knows that only this um, uh, this source file has been changed, and therefore it compiles only that. Linker is very fast. You get your result very fast. With whole, uh, with uh, link time optimiz optimization and with whole program analysis, these changes can have significant effects on inlining across the, all of the you know resultant binary, and uh, therefore everything needs to be re-optimized. Basically, everything needs to be not parsed 
but uh, yeah, re-optimized and the rest of the compilation phase has to happen uh, for all of the application. Uh, if you ever happen to find a bug in the compiler, it's much more difficult to report it with LTO because you do not only have to uh, reduce one source file to the you know minimum to get the minimum reproducible input, but you have to do it across various source files, and that can be very tedious. And it is it is very transparent to the user, but it is not hundred uh, percent transparent. Some things have to be compiled, and some things are better compiled without LTO. The one case that stands out are top level. Uh, ASM directives, where you put assembly into your um, uh, assembly bits into your C file, but they are not part of a function. They are standalone. They either do something to a symbol. They can. They usually do very fairly wild uh, stuff, and uh, they also very often. Um, basically depend on being in the same compilation unit that the assembler sees as some other symbol. And uh, very often, you know, w w with the automatic partitioning, that may, be, that may not be the case. I told you that it was a lot of work. This slide obviously is not from me, it's from Honza Hubička, who likes to talk about GCC history. I started with the GCC project in late 2006, early 2007. And um, yeah, the LTO was the talk of the town. Everybody was talking about how great it's going to be. And people were starting to you know, really work on it in the sense that that was what they wanted to achieve. Uh, I think that after five years in development, about 2010, we sort of had something. And uh, but it was barely able to compile a spec, and, and but improved very very quickly from that point on. We could build Firefox, which is a you know very big application containing all sorts of interesting uh, things in it in, in in the source. And we've been working on it ever since. Um, and um, a lot of the effort was actually put into making the information that is being streamed out and in and uh, work with much smaller and smaller and smaller so that the LTO, so, so that looking at the, you know, at the entire application at the same time is tenable, faster, more convenient for the user. Uh, last but not least, in 2018 with, well, with release of GCC 8, it's been done slightly earlier, I believe in 2017, nevertheless it's part of the compiler that was released uh, this year, we now can handle debug info much, much better than in the past. In the past, really C++ debug info didn't, very, didn't work most of the time. You saw uh, unmangled symbols in the debugger. That should now work. So that was the final obstacle um, that, prevented, uh, that we think was preventing widespread adoption of LTO. And now we would like to encourage everybody to you know, have a look at it and ideally use it. So let's have a look at what uh, how, how it does when we when we switch LTO on. Um, in my first talk, I was talking about spec benchmarks. Um, it is customary to evaluate stuff on spec benchmarks, and so we can have a look at them as well. One thing that I should say first, though, is that LTO works very uh, well with profile guided optimization, which is also sometimes called feedback driven optimization, but it's the same thing. What it means that you first run your application on some training data set, you collect profile, you actually measure profile that, that the, the binary saves into a file after it exits or during its, during its run. And uh, this information actually contains uh, counters and, and, and other things that uh, then can be streamed in in a second compilation round and will provide information to the compiler where the application probably spends a lot of time, what parts of it should be optimized really, really for speed, what parts of it are rarely or probably never uh, executed and are you know, these are then pu put into code sections, they are optimized for size in order not to pollute mm, cache and not to take up too much space on the disk because you know, they're probably not very useful. Um, with that in mind, um, these data, unlike, uh, unlike those on Monday, are actually, you know, times, so smaller is better, 
in any way, green is good, red is not so good. Uh, the middle color-coded column uh, are speed-ups, and there are only speed-ups, when you uh, just write FLTO on, uh, you know, on the command line of the compiler and the linker. And uh, just with that, you will get 10% you know, speed up on speed ups on two of the benchmarks and uh, some on the other. These are integer rates. If you also invoke PGO, uh, this can be even, even bigger because um, LTO gives the compiler the ability to actually do a lot of changes, but it's difficult to see where those changes should be done and which changes should be done at what point. And, and PGO provides that information, so that is not unexpected. We do have some regret. We do have one big regression there. Uh, we haven't looked into it. It is possible. I, I'm not saying that's the case, but I have, I have seen. Uh, we, uh, recently, we have seen a, a, a regression much bigger than this in the spec 2006 uh, suite, and that was because the training run uh, was bad. It didn't, the, uh, during the training run, the hottest loop was not executed at all, and it was optimized for size, not for speed, and it was slow. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying this is, you know, the exchange is the same case, but that's what can happen uh, with PGO, and that's what you have to be careful about. This is the same thing, just floating point benchmarks. Um, as you can see, again, it's, you know, it, 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 not, it can happen probably because of um, suboptimal inlining decisions that what you get is actually slightly slower code, but usually it helps, and again, um, Profile guided optimization can um, help you further. The more interesting fact is when we look at the sizes of the binary. These are binaries. These are uh, uh, these are sizes of all the benchmarks that you have seen uh, in the previous two slides. So it's spec to spec 2017 integer and floating point combined. And I'm comparing the binaries that were cr um, created with LTO and LTO plus PGO uh, with those that were created during the normal standard um, way of compilation when, when we compiled each compilation unit uh, from the source to the assembly. 100% is the same as before. So you can see that in a few cases it was actually slightly larger, but in many cases it was significantly, significantly smaller, and that is what often happens with uh, with LTO. Um, a lot of it is aggressive removal of that code, but also you know ability uh, to inline and optimize out, optimize away stuff uh, that can be optimized basically away when inlined. Uh, and so on and so forth. So there, you know, even on spec, or mainly on spec, there are uh, significant savings in uh, the size of the binary. And in the previous talk, we have seen that, uh, you know, if you were trying to update spec over LTE, you would be much happier if you had uh, them compiled with LTO. On the other hand, we do not only evaluate on spec, because uh, spec is an important suite, an important benchmark, and it, is, it, it represents fairly reasonably well some types of workloads, mainly the high performance ones, or the CPU intensive ones, but uh, a lot of the distribution, all of the programs that we run, um, yeah, they, they look rather differently. So what we also look uh, at a, are other, <laughs> other programs, and mainly Firefox, because it is huge. And uh, it does give quite a nice insight about how LTO is, you know, development is progressing in uh, GCC. So, um, yeah, the first point I basically said, the, the spec characteristics are quite different. Uh, Firefox is very big. Um, the build when you use LTO uh, of Firefox is 14% slower than when you do not use it. Uh, so there is a slowdown, but it is not nothing catastrophic. Uh, that basically means that linking of the largest DSO, which is you know by far the largest bit of Firefox that there is, it takes about eight minutes on Hansa's desktop. I'm not sure if it's desktop or notebook, but 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 on his machine. And peak memory is actually about 10 gigabytes, uh, and it is roughly the same as when you use LTO or when you don't use it, of course, provided that you do parallel um, build. If you build one 
um, one compile unit after another, then of course it would be much less, but um, the building time would would not be eight minutes, but I don't know, eight days perhaps, maybe much, much significantly bigger. Well, um, Firefox community does have benchmarks and uh, they have benchmarked uh, LTO builds for Honza. Um, and there were some rather significant improvements, especially in responsiveness. The benchmark is called TP50, if I remember correctly. Uh, these are information from Honza. Uh, Firefox people are basically timing how long it takes to load and display, or just, oh, not sure, display, but load and, and, and parse uh, a bunch of most popular website on the web. It's probably better not to think of what those might be. Uh, but, um, you know, with Firefox and LTO, they load and display much, much faster. Uh, but there have also been improvements, noticeable ones, on uh, also other benchmarks, especially if you also um, add profile feedback just to the LTO. This is another favorite slide of Honza. Uh, this is output of Firefox performance monitoring tool. Uh, the yellow dots are, are uh, measurements of how the main line of Firefox is doing on uh, the Dromeo DOM benchmark. And the violet dots uh, are um, benchmarks that are um, uh, that are benchmarking uh, some custom modifications that, that, that are uh, timing how long it takes for uh, an experimental patch um, to, to, to render the sites. Or, or, or. And uh, the one that's right on the top, and this particular slide higher is better, the, one, the, the, the several violet dots at the top, that's the time when they were testing GCC LTO, so at least during this time frame that you can see at, uh, at the bottom, Firefox with LTO was the best uh, binary that they could produce. Similarly, uh, on this slide, lower is better, where they were um, testing responsiveness. When, when they just switched on LTO, the responsiveness, when they were doing that in, in, in March, apparently improved quite a lot. Then they were able to change their sources so, to, so that they are more responsible on their own. And uh, as far as we know, they haven't tried with LTO again, but there was a significant effect. Um, before we had a look at the, at the size of the binaries, so let's do that again, but now with a much, much bigger binary. At the top, you can see how big the resultant binary is with GCC 6, 7, and 8 when you use O3, LTO, and uh, yeah, feedback-driven optimization. Remember, I told you that's the other acronym of PGO. It's exactly the same thing. Um, it's slightly improving, but not necessarily, um, you know, the improvements are not necessarily huge. But when you play with the compilation options and the optimi optimization levels, it gets more interesting. So the second group are represents of the sizes of Firefox binaries when they are compiled with O3, O2, uh, O3 and feedback-driven optimization, and uh, OS. So when you tell the compiler that it should really concentrate on size only. And the third group that has now appeared are equivalents of that with LTO. And what you can see is not only is the Firefox built with LTO faster in many ways, but it is also always slower, uh, so, sorry, smaller uh, than the uh, than the corresponding uh, optimization level without LTO. Um, so it always uh, saves space. And uh, when you are uh, afraid or, or thinking carefully whether you want to, for example, use O3 uh, because uh, it might increase your binary quite a bit and, and you want to keep your binary small, uh, LTO can uh, alleviate that problem. You can get O3 performance with uh, not quite O as size, but something that's smaller than O2. And uh, yeah, but it helps whatever optimization level you choose, it always helps the um, size of the result. When you compare that with Clung, which also does have uh, 
actually two Altio modes. Uh, this only works for them when uh, they optimize for size. Otherwise, um, the otherwise uh, the LTO binaries produced at O3 and O2 are for some reason actually bigger, which is interesting. Uh, we do not know why you know, something like that should happen if you do your removal of unreachable stuff properly. Nevertheless, uh, that's what we observed uh, with Clung 6 at least. And, um, so what we then proceeded, mainly Martin Liška, um, was trying to build as much of OpenSUSE with LTO as we possibly can. If you were preparing your slides on OpenSUSE Tumbleweed in LibreOffice and you upgraded, when you and you did an upgrade in the last many months, then you were preparing your slides on an LTO built library. We do build Lib LibreOffice in Tumbleweed with LTO and it seems to just work. If it crashed during when you were preparing the presentation, then that's not fault of LTO. That must have been definitely something else. But we tried more. So what Martin did was that he created a staging project, and in it, he basically switched LTO by default and rebuilt the whole, uh, whole distribution. What happened? Uh, you know, 2,300 roughly packages, and 80 of them failed, which is not bad. Uh, considering that, uh, as I told you before, it is not 100% transparent for the user. Um, sometimes care has to be taken. Just 80 packages failing, I believe that's rather, you know, surprisingly good result. And uh, so the next thing that he did was that he disabled LTO for these 80 packages and ran OpenQA. And, uh, you know, he claims that the result was mostly okay. There were some small glitches, but basically it passed. So our goal, really, what we would like to see is to see as much of OpenSUSE Tumbleweed to be built with LTO. There will be glitches, but that, we believe that's the only way how we can fix the bugs so that it is really as reliable and as useful as the standard method of compilation with all the benefits that we can hopefully get. More details about what was happening when he mm, uh, evaluated the build of OpenSUSE with LTO. Um, so the, all of the distribution was 5.6% smaller. Uh, the biggest reduction in, in, in a single SO was 16% of you know, 10 megabytes smaller. So if, you're, if you are updating that package over LTE, you just save yourself 10, 10 megabytes. Uh, the biggest reduction in, in packages uh, uh, were even even bigger. There were problems, um, 80 of them, um, and uh, some of these problems are bugs in the linker or in the compiler. I believe the one that's referenced here has been actually recently fixed. Um, and um, another issue that we ha that has reoccurred uh, quite frequently was that it is not really possible to use the ASM directive to create a sim symbol version for uh, in order to version your functions, to version your DSO interface, mainly because, as I told you, the global freestanding um, assembler directives are problematic. They almost always refer to something else in the same compilation unit, and that may not be the case after um, partitioning. So what we will do, and what people that use this methodology, if they want to be compatible with LTO, have to do, is use a new function attribute that we plan to introduce for GCC9. Another issue are static libraries. We only have um, a few, but we have a few nevertheless. And if you just blindly use LTO, what will happen is that the library will not contain object code but it will contain the intermediate language that is only specific for the compiler which, which you used uh, to build it. That's not what you want. And, and uh, so what should happen is that those should be compiled with the fat LTO objects option, and um, which means, which is an option that causes GCC to, you know, during the first stages when you, when you really 
call GCC like you would in 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 the old days, and when you uh, create the the first .o file, it adds the intermediate language section there, but it also keeps the old object uh, section, the te text section there. So it does this, the, the old way of things and the new way of things. Then what happens usually in these packages is that they build um, the DSO and, uh, and .a, sorry, .so and .a files. So the, in the .a files, we would strip the section away. They're not really useful. Um, and uh, even though they, they could be, but because they're so dependent on compiler version, we don't want them to be there. Uh, and there might, may be other reasons too. But uh, the you know building DSO can actually still uh, use the intermediate language sections and optimize um, the shared library. It would be nice to detect these cases and uh, to have a sanitizer in build service. And um, uh, and I believe that this is basically the you know the same thing as that LTO. Uh, code can end up in 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 the object file, which is which sometimes that's what you do not want. Um, another thing is warning in C plus plus. You have a rule that each type name has to be unique, meaning that if you have two types that have the same name and they are different, you violated C plus um, plus specification and your program has undefined behavior. If you keep those types just in you know in, in in different compilation units, you may be able to get away with it now. But as we now, when we now look at the whole program and we see two different types with uh, the same name, that can cause all sorts of things. So you know, currently we only warn for it, but quite a few packages fail because that's what they have in them. Um, we do have configure scripts that look into the .o file and search for um, object specific patterns of object code there, but there's no object code, so that doesn't work, has to be updated. Uh, debug info in the DWZ tool, uh, the, the new way of producing debug info in the DWZ tool is rather problematic and uh, DWZ probably has to have a few bug, bugs fixed. And uh, it can happen that the memory constraints of analyzing the whole uh, application of the package can be quite a bit higher, and sometimes they, sh you know, they should be marked accordingly. Mm, top level assembly, we have already talked uh, talked about that. And uh, I believe the last slide, and that's the effect of, uh, you know, that's the size reduction or increase in the various packages. Um, so as you can see, there are a few packages that are slightly larger and, 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 and a tiny uh, group of them is almost 120% of the previous size, but uh, more than half had their size reduced and some of them fairly significantly. So definitely LTO is one way of uh, reducing size of our binaries that we do not have stuff in them that is unreachable, that is not used, that is not useful in any way. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I hope I'm ready to answer any of your questions. There is a question at the back. Okay. Does it work? Okay, um, so you mentioned GPO, and I'm curious, uh, does that work reasonably well with shared libraries? What I mean is, uh, I would like to optimize a shared library based on uh, test runs of an application which links against that library. Is that something that works out of the box? I believe so, yeah. Uh, you have to be careful with you know training your library just as you would you, yeah. know, you would be with your uh, normal program even more so if it's used in different ways by different clients yeah. uh, but uh, running yeah. that code produces the gda files and uh, those can be then fed in back into the compiler and it just works okay so that is per object file like 
um, I can run that with different uh, applications and then just create a profile which will serve that library. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, that's cool. Any other question regarding LTM? So yeah, um, we'll be very happy if you consider trying it. Uh, not sure whether you want to try it on kernel. I know that Andy Clean did, and he succeeded, uh, but all of his work was then refused uh, for one reason or another. That was many years ago. Maybe it's a <laughs> time to revisit, even though it probably does not play very nicely with life matching. Um, but <laughs> yeah, there are trade-offs, and sometimes you want to take one way or the other. Anyway, if there are no, few, uh, no further questions, then thank you for attention, and I'll hand over to Wojciech when the next track finishes. Thank you.